Hello, and welcome to the UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Ben Martin, Assistant Director of Health Humanities at the School of Medicine Center for Health Humanities and Ethics. As many of you know, Medical Center Hour is our weekly public forum on medicine and society that has been running for over five decades. We're happy to see so many of you joining us today for our final event of the academic semester featuring a particularly timely discussion. Um, first, a brief word about the structure for today's event. Our participants have completed conflict of interest statements and have no disclosures. Please also note that continuing education credit can be claimed for today's event. We invite you to follow directions at the bottom of the handout posted in the chat to claim your CE. When the time comes for the question and answer portion of the event, please send questions through the Q&A option on Zoom. Today, we all face a large question together. What does it mean to be a healthcare professional in the time of climate change? The Glasgow Climate Change Conference recently concluded with important pledges to cut methane emissions and stop deforestation. But when we read news coverage about climate change, a pessimistic tone stands out. Elizabeth Colbert's piece on COP26 in this week's New Yorker closes with a quote from Boris Johnson. Humanity has long since run down the clock on climate change. James Butler writes in this week's London Review of Books that a viable ecological platform would require a bonfire of pieties and a willingness to use the state as never before. At the end of the book, Environmetics, The Impact of Climate Change on Human Health, co-authors Dr. Jay Lemery and Dr. Paul Auerbach pose a blunt question of their own. Will we be the cursed generation of the era of the great procrastination, or will we educate each other, change our behaviors, and protect our progeny with a like-minded purpose? There is no one better to address these questions with an eye toward action and maybe even a little optimism than today's speaker, Dr. Jay Lemery himself. In addition to co-authoring Environmetics, published in 2017, Dr. Lemery co-edited Global Climate Change and Human Health from Science to Practice, now in its second edition. He is currently the medical director for the National Science Foundation's Polar Research Program and a physician consultant to the exploration medical capability element of NASA's Human Research Program. From 2014 through 2016, he was the EMS Medical Director for the U.S. Antarctic Program. And from 2011 through 2016, he was a consultant for the Climate and Health Program at the CDC. His significant body of research includes co-authoring the landmark New England Journal of Medicine study on excess mortality in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Dr. Lemery holds academic appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health, where he is a contributing editor for its journal, Health and Human Rights, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and in 2021 was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Lemery was also an Eccles Scholar at the University of Virginia and received his MD from the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. From 2003 through four, he was Chief Resident in Emergency Medicine at NYU in Bellevue. And now he is currently Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and serves as a co-director for their Innovative Climate and Health Program. After his presentation, UVA's own Dr. Homan Wei will serve as a respondent and offer his perspective on integrating climate change into medical education. Dr. Wei is Associate Professor of Medical Education and the Internal Medicine Clerkship Director at UVA School of Medicine in Nova Campus. Among many teaching awards, he received the Golden Apple Award for Teaching Excellence, the top honor across all undergraduate medical education at Inova. Dr. Way served as planning committee member and moderator of this year's inaugural Virginia Climate and Health Education Collaborative Summit and is vice chair for education and operation and recruitment of the Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. He is also the co-instructor of UVA's brand new fourth, elected, uh, fourth year elective on health and climate change. Uh, so with all that, knowing how illustrious our guests are, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lemery and Dr. Way. Great. Thanks, Ben. That was a wonderful intro, and it's great to be virtually back in Charlottesville. Let me uh, share my slides. All right. <clears throat> Confirming you guys got, uh, can hear me and got good slides. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So uh, as Ben mentioned, the, probably the, the biggest credential I'd like to share was, boom, uh, I, I'm a proud Wahoo. And it's, again, I wish we could be there in person, but um, it's uh, it's wonderful to be have this invitation. What I want to talk to you about today is let's talk just kind of back up a little bit and think about where we are in all of this. What and as this is primarily a health centric uh, group, talk about the clinical disease of climate change. What exactly does that mean? 
I want to share a case with you because I think it illustrates um, the uh, proof of concept potential, but also still some real formidable obstacles that we have in advancing this within the house of medicine. I want to reflect on climate change communication. I want to talk about our inception of a climate medicine program and what that means. And then really talk about that already, even though many people haven't even that don't have this at their schools or don't have a climate medicine program, we already are changing our competencies in 2021. They're already obsolete if this is moving so fast. And then talk finally end up with a scale up and um, maybe a roadmap for replication of advancing a comprehensive agenda, which you know uh, peer organizations and healthcare systems can sort of pick and choose and say, hey, okay, let's let's do this together. So what exactly are we talking about as climate change is a health issue? And I think um, I'm gonna present how I used to finish my, um, my lectures. And I sort of ended with, well, it's a disease of infections, respiratory distress, food insecurity, waterborne illness, heat stress, mental illness, displacement and trauma. Those are the kind of the big, the big heavy hitters. But really when we contextualize it in what happens in places like Puerto Rico, and the, um, you know, the, the places hit by tropical hurricanes, uh, the Gulf Coast and what's going on in California, my, my elevator pitch is that climate change is a disease of vulnerability and disasters. And that's my talk, thanks for having me. So um, I've advanced this and um, all of us have our conversation and you, we just can't stop there anymore. That's the 101 version, but really, it's a disease of ineffective communication, systems failures, and a lack of leadership. And on that last one, <clears throat> I think is the, um, the compelling driver that has led a lot of us to sort of fill that void. And I tried to find a good quote. I'm not sure this is the quote, but it's a quote. Um, In periods where there's no leadership, society stands still. Harry Truman said that. And I think um, there's been a vacuum and I think we in healthcare are rapidly filling it, but there is uh, ample room for us to fill this even more. And hopefully I can um, uh, convince you of that today. I wanna pivot to give you a little bit of a, um, a case from a recent past and illustrate something for you. So September, 2017, a tropical hurricane, right? Energized weather systems, uh, category five smashed into the um, Caribbean and specifically pummeled Puerto Rico. 3.1 million Americans live there, the worst natural disaster in recorded history to affect the island, 10th most in intense tropical cyclone in the Atlantic on record. Um, widespread damage, infrastructure, food, power, communications, um, water and security, and then just outright uh, displacement and, and trauma. It was at this time that the Institute of Forensic Sciences, so the medical examiner, said, okay, um, here is the death toll. Um, a lot of us sort of looked at that agape, mouth is agape, and said, this is, this is really, this seems low. Um, and at that point, you know, there was some suspicion of politicization of that number um, for all sorts of reasons. But again, it just seemed very low for the uh, medical examiner to report that. Earlier that year, we had started something at the University of Colorado. And what we had said is let's start a climate and health so science policy fellowship. And it was very much in the mold of a traditional GME fellowship. I'm emergency medicine. So our uh, clinicians worked in our emergency room and we had one and we said, hey, what are the competencies? And we published on this and um, they're very basic competencies. You can see here, knowledge, 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 um, a little bit of impact and vulnerability assessments, You know, some sense of what the climate and health 101 and who's doing what, what agencies are active. And then number six, being able to have a robust uh, public stakeholder engagement skills. We were funded by a Denver-based um, uh, nonprofit and we're able to place our fellow in Washington, um, as well as the CDC, but more at the NIHS. And it was great. 
So um, our fellowship had been up and running and this, this event happened in the fall. And again, we look at that number 64. And it was at this point, people began to sort of talk. Um, friends in different places said, you know, we may work for the government, we may not, but we can't really act on this. But you and academia <clears throat> absolutely have the uh, wherewithal to study this and report on it. And would you please take a look? Um, and so at that point, we uh, put a consortium together with friends at the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, the Albiza University in Puerto Rico and said, all right, let's cobble together some funds, some people. We sent our climate fellow. This was, again, sort of an exciting proof of concept of boots on the ground. And it didn't hurt that they had clinical skills as well and say, let's how much time do we have? How much money? Great. Let's go do a. Uh, public health survey very much in very uh, excellent methodologies because we knew there'd be a lot of scrutiny under this study and do an excess mortality study. And <clears throat> this is what we came up with. And we knew we had a unique opportunity to get it out there. We got it into the New England Journal. And the mean, I think, was, you know, 600 to 6,000, maybe 8,000, 800 to 8,000. So it was a wide distribution, again, reflecting that it wasn't a deep comprehensive study. It was, I think, two weeks boots on the ground. <clears throat> but there's our mean, 4645, which again is different than 64. Um, Sherry Fink at the New York Times broke the news. Now this is, that was the fall. Now it's the spring, it's Memorial Day, three-day weekend, the Tuesday after the news broke uh, in the New York Times. The Washington Post put this on the cover. So again, we're like, okay, this is actually a good thing. We're we're proving that this is a uh, we're, that 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 this is out there. It's it's science in action. But then this is what happened, and we probably shouldn't have been so naive. So this immediately begins to get warped. All sorts of the media. So Twitter, we have Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Elizabeth Warren, all weighing in on this. And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, CIA Director Gina Haspel is poking uh, at our methodologies. Um, and then the mayor of San Juan gets a black hat, prints 4645 on it, and people are marching in New York with that same number. So taking on a life of its own, uh, really just you know a, a trigger um, to, for everyone um, with all sorts of agenda um, built, into, built into this. And then uh, by the perverse metric of uh, our times, um, we ended up having a presidential tweet on it. And it was, albeit came a little bit later. Um, and there it is. So again, so much going on, which again, sowed confusion as to, did we actually do a good thing? But in the end, we think we did because this is what happened. Puerto Rico ordered to release death records. The excess mortality ended up in best practices around, you know, best practice methodologies and bigger studies around 25, 2700, right? Um, you know, within the bell curve. But we saw this as a win and um, it shined a flashlight um, on um, a very dark part of, uh, you know, a, a dark reporting and really proved to us that this is a, again, a energized weather system driven or force multiplied by climate change and has consequences to human health. And that's all we wanted. Um, okay. So we began to get some press from this. And this was, again, this was the beginning of this idea of a climate fellow and this program and the wall street journal, right? Ben's conservative and said, Hey, look, they, they covered this. And the last sentence was, you know, CU department of emergency medicine offers a fellowship for physicians on climate and health policy. It was exciting. We were getting accolades from all over and it felt very, uh, we felt rather chuffed by this, but Right after that, the Wall Street Journal um, uh, published a op-ed by a physician from Penn. Um, and you can tell by the, um, by the byline, take two aspirin and call me by my pronouns, that there is a real backlash to this sort of um, engagement in this type of thing from, uh, from a medical campus. If the country needs more gun control and climate change activists, medical schools are not the right place to produce them. I unfortunately was on vacation at the time, so I missed all of this. So I couldn't write my skating op-ed or our letter to the editor. Um, uh, but again, it's one person's opinion. Okay, fair enough. 
aha, not so fast. Then the editorial board doubled down saying left-wing medical Twitter, yes, there is such a thing. And, uh, and further went on to say, patients want an accurate diagnosis, not a lecture on social justice or climate change. So um, I, I'm not gonna sit here and make a rebuttal. I, you know, I would say in the grand tradition of Sir William Osler, you know, we must look at the social drivers of disease, just like we have to talk to teenagers about gun violence when we take bullets out of their skin in the ED or worse. Um, we have to talk about diet in diabetes, and we've been talking about smoking for decades, right? So it's an extension of that. I suspect many of you feel the same way. But the point is, is that this isn't sort of the, you know, an idea that's just been accepted all over, right? We still have some challenges here. Okay, this is a picture taken by a alumni of the of, of University of Colorado School of Medicine, a physician in space. He did grand rounds, and. Uh, you know, he was live from the space station and he was showing us all the microgravity stuff. The grand rounds was packed, you know, 250 people in the auditorium. And then, you know, a punk med student in the back, is, he raises his hand. He's like, hey, point the camera out the window. And he pointed out the window and all of us in the room just had this collective. Uh, and it was just magnificent, you know, to be able to see the planet um, in its big form. Okay, so kind of back to that original um, proposition is how do we how do we characterize this as a disease and how do we communicate and assess this risk? So I'm just going to take a step back and maybe give you a sense of where we've been with it and sort of how we have constructed the rationale to get w where we are, which I'll talk about at the end. And you know, how do we contextualize this when we've got crazy weather all over the place? right? Worst winter ever. I think Boston had its snowiest winter ever, um, fourth snowiest on record, right? Since the Pilgrims uh, a couple of years ago. And, you know, Newfoundland never had snow like this and now it does. And really this is the, the challenge of science communication, right? Um, snowballs on the floor of the Senate. It's freezing outside. How can there be a global warming? It makes no sense. And really what, what's important for us to do as science communicators is to step back <clears throat> talk about, you know, really break it down. And, and, and again, clinicians are the best at this. We know one, we're the most trusted. Nurses are the most trusted, physicians right behind. And um, we do this all day long at the bedside. You, you have to take the medicine because it opens up the artery and the clot to make the plumbing better. So there's no blockage downstream, right? We do this all day long. We're expert science communicators. Um, and really go back to the basics of climate change and say, hey, look, this isn't a lump of clay where the heat lamp is getting hotter and now you have a lump of clay. We have an extraordinarily complex system. And what we're effectively doing is trapping energy or adding energy to it. And that doesn't make it a warmer planet, although it does, but it does so much more. It makes it a more unpredictable planet. Um, and so a lot of people said we should have never gone with global warming back in the day. We should have gone with global energizing. And then our climate change communication specialists say, no, 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 don't, don't use global energizing. It's, it's too optimistic. So I, I invoke Catherine Hayhoe, who's a colleague at Texas Tech, um, who actually has a podcast called Global Weirding. And I think that's probably um, the, best, uh, the, the best way to characterize this. So if you still don't get this or you're, you know, Thanksgiving's next week. We have a lot of uh, uh, family interactions coming up. Um, the one thing I like to do is say, look, let, let's boil it down to something everyone gets. And let's take a complex system. And at the time I took my young daughter and said, uh, and share an experiment and say, look, let's do an experiment of a complex system. Let's add energy to it and see what happens. <clears throat> so I took um, uh, the most pure form of energy for a four-year-old, which is a uh, concentrated colored sugar and say what happens. So at first there wasn't indeed a linear relationship. We saw a hypergenic, hyper energetic child doing physiologic super uh, feats of strength. But then that linear relationship deviated and began to see a wobble where we had paradoxical hypersomnolence, erratic behavior, well beyond two standard deviations from the norm. And that's a fun way of just saying um, 
everyone gets this, climate change is crazy town. We're dumping raw energy into an unpredictable system. And now the expected outcomes of a weather in our any of our communities is not only shifting, let me see from my, your perspective, a little warmer, but that bell curve is getting much wider. So that's where the crazy comes in. <clears throat> How do we communicate this risk? Um, so going back to 101, right? We use that power of science communication, that doctor-patient relationship, nurse-patient relationship, the power of the bedside, and reframe it. And in fact, I've used this slide for 15 years, and this has been the money slide. I feel like it's becoming part of uh, everyone kind of gets it now or getting it, which is a good thing, right? It shows that, you know, we need to, we're advancing the conversation, but get away from the polar bears on an iceberg and get it to kids with inhalers, get away from altruism, you know, save the whales, love mother earth and abstractions like, oh my God, 415 parts per million, million of carbon dioxide. You know, what, what does that mean to most people? And, um, and what's the imperative to act when we're thinking about saving whales? Very different than our parents' risk of chronic lung disease, our kids' risk of asthma. <clears throat> really double down on that. We are trusted communicators. And now the communication science is advancing, right? I was trained how to take care of patients. I was not trained on how to be a trusted communicator in the public sphere, right? Um, but we, luckily we've got people we can lean on. And right up the road at George Mason is Ed Maybach at the uh, Clim um, Center for Climate Change Communication. And he, I call it Maybach's Pentad. I don't think it hasn't really stuck. I thought it would go wild, you know, viral on Twitter. It didn't. Um, but nevertheless, Maybach's Pentad, it's real. Okay. It's actually the data supports it. It's us, human caused. Experts agree. Pick your expert within your constituency to know who is valued expert. It's bad. There are consequences. There are real health outcomes. Number five, the most important. And too many of us for too long stopped at number four. Uh, there's hope. And now there's more hope than ever. And uh, it's, it, it's quite exciting. And so that's the messaging in a, in a nutshell uh, for those that are, are interested in taking this forward and being a, being a trusted messenger. Where did we begin and how did we get to where we are now? And I'm going to go back to 2012, which is when I left uh, New York City. We just had a baby and we moved to Colorado. And as I began to think about this, I thought, well, what would a curriculum look like? And, uh, you know, when you're writing a curriculum de novo as a young academician, someone whispers in your ear, hey, man, you know, you should get the, get the textbook together. So we pulled the team together and uh, we came up with a textbook on this. And like any good um, speaker, I'll plug the second edition just came out last year. Um, but we knew this was still lacking and I knew it was lacking from these guys who came up to me and they said, Hey, Lemery, we read your book. It, it was awesome. And you, you know, they're lying because no one can read a book that's 672 pages of just raw science. It's like reading, you know, Harrison's or one of those things, right? It's just, it's a textbook. So I was like, okay, uh, we've got to do better. And my mentor at the time, you know, the late Paul Auerbach, who you may know as the founder of emergency or wilderness medicine, um, which I had really, that's how I got my start. Um, we spoke and said, we have to write a book. And our book was called Environmetics. We made up the name, but it was really meant to take the reader to the bedside and give that visceral feel of climate and health. And, you know, what we did, if, if you all have read it, maybe some of you are clinicians have kind of rolled your eyes. And I, that was meant to roll your eyes because it was meant to kind of be, um, again, a little bit more visceral for the lay public to say, this is what it's like to uh, intubate an 11 year old girl on a sidewalk in South Bronx because it's, the air quality is so bad because the air has been so hot, ozone's out of control and she's breaking through her inhalers, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and that was, that was where we were. And really we wanted to take the reader to the bedside and through this communication, move the needle. But again, um, you know, this was about this data I'm going to show you is from 2016. This is, this is where we were. 
And if you look here at that time, it's better now, um, half of Americans weren't even convinced that this was our fault, right? So how do you begin to think about policy when you haven't even convinced them that there's a thing, right? So it was at that time we were like, we have to have, we have to lead on this. We have got to lean in and, and dive in on this. And that's where we uh, started our program. We were funded by the Dean, um, which again, I'm happy to talk to anyone out, offline how to, um, what our pitch was and how that, how that played out. But we were very fortunate. And we started um, this fellowship, which I, which I had alluded to earlier. And we've turned out uh, be, at that point, uh, the one, the one um, once a year model uh, for fellows <clears throat> who've gone on, to, gone, on, gone on to do really great things. And here are the competencies. You know, we had um, you know fluency with climate and health impacts, uh, mitigation and adaptation, um, uh, capacity to lead programmatic development. So we would teach them how to build. You know, very much we were doing that, but also give them uh, skills and experience uh, to do that, and really push those science communication skills. And that's where we've been the last five years, but. It's all changing now, and that the rest of my talk is going to be, um, this isn't good enough anymore. You know those competencies I just showed you. We have got to have better skill sets for all the opportunities that are coming down the pike, um, and really, we have got to start to think about how do we um, have core competencies that allow uh, um, climate medicine doctors or and our physicians and our nurses to be credible knowledgeable, effective, and be able to lead. Um, so the, um, there's been evolution of this. There's a group at Columbia, which I've been involved with for a few years that has now pulled all these competencies together. And they're very clear to say it's not a one size fits all, but it's a, it's a list of competencies relevant to all schools of health. So, um, public health, nursing, pharmacy, APP, med schools, and um, all over the world. And there's a, I think there's a consortium of about 200 schools throughout the world. Um, and so here, the, again, five areas of practice. Again, this kind of looks familiar, right, what we've talked about. But I think we have to go deeper. And what we're now seeing um, from, from us and a few of our peers is um, deeper dives into these additional topics of fluency. Um, we have got to be able to have a more sound foundation to effectively spar with hospital CEOs, community leaders, and policymakers beyond that traditional silo um, and need um, you know, communication training, leadership, and public policy training. Because the truth is, we have, again, not, has to be, not have to be experts, but we have to have some fluency in linking extreme heat and geopolitical instability and vulnerable communities and pandemics, uh, loss of biodiversity and how that actually undermines health and even abstract things like food insecurity and extreme weather, um, we, going a little bit deeper. We'll need to contextualize contemporary issues of environmental justice, right? Th we're, this is not an unfamiliar domain. It just is a different um, topic, right? So. Pediatricians have led for decades on, um, on lead exposure for children, right? They have been leaders in that. Um, emergency medicine on substance abuse and gun violence, family medicine, you know, really elevated techniques on behavior change. And the list goes on and on. We just have to pull from those um, best traditions and, and, and upgrade our operating systems to think about climate change. And really that, um, that single most important message, which is that the poor and sick are going to get pummeled from this, right? Our most vulnerable communities, um, socioeconomic, geographic, physiologic vulnerability. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing that physicians will have to be comfortable with is the, um, the big green data and the plethora of metrics from many different sources on all things climate and health that are now you know, basically being dump trucked into our uh, collective knowledge and our domains. So think about the Lancet countdown. For those that aren't familiar, Lancet early on characterized this as the biggest global health threat of the next century. 
and then went on to say, aha, also the biggest global health opportunity, right? So something very, a very intriguing twist and has had annual reports, both global and US centric um, on progress on, you know, and it's all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's health metrics, it's community engagement, business expenditures, um, green, greening and decarbonization of healthcare systems. But all these things, right? It's earth science, energy use profiles, um, uh, health outcomes, patient vulnerabilities. So how, how do we synthesize all of this into making decisions on behalf of anyone, but particularly our healthcare systems, right? Practice Green Health is a wonderful organization that contracts with hospitals and um, they're able to generate big data, numerous cross-sector metrics on healthcare sustainability and resiliency. Um, and again, so the data is there. I think there's still a lack of leadership or really a lack of science to understand what you do with that data and what are the really the best things to do. Um, it's just very complicated. Um, and so, again, I think you'll see a lot of movement in this area to try and have um, for, for hospital leaders and physician leaders to be able to keep up and really understand how to take this data, um, crunch it appropriately and, and think about what would be relevant to your specific environment of a healthcare system, whether it's in Virginia or Colorado or wherever. And really, you know, why physicians? Because physicians will always be leaders in healthcare systems and necessarily so, I believe, to maintain that patient-centric posture, right? And I, I think that that's why we have got to learn how to do this and learn how to lead on it. We'll never be as um, fluent as a computer scientist. That's not the point. The point is, is that you can hang in a conversation and be able to, again, pull all these things together and uh, understand how to uh, make smart strategy and smart policy. I think there's going to be a carrot and stick um, um, opportunities coming down the pike. The HHS just said, uh, just established an office of climate change and health equity. Um, very exciting, still being stood up. And uh, at the, at the um, uh, press conference announcing this, uh, the secretary you know, hinted to the fact that we'll use every tool at our disposal regarding uh, hospital reimbursements, right? So this, the fact that this was even a hedge is very interesting to think, you know, how are hospital systems going to be able to think about decarbonizing and making their systems resilient? Um, and um, I had the opportunity, we may talk about this in a few minutes, uh, to go to COP26 and heard uh, Secretary Rachel Levine, undersecretary at HHS, join the uh, COP26 health program which um, commits um, HHS to pursue policies of decarbonization of the healthcare system and building climate resilient healthcare systems, right? So lack of details, but the fact that this was done in a very public forum by a senior HHS official should have everyone that is in administration of hospital be paying attention to this, being like, aha, okay, this is a thing um, and it's going to have real you know, trickle down implications. <clears throat> when we think about the lessons from COVID and the inherent injustices we've seen, again, there's very few who can articulate that dizzy interplay between public health, energy, geopolitics, earth science, government, medicine, but we've seen it, right? We've seen, we have, we, in a sense, we've had a test drive or a proof of concept where physicians left and right were really the, the clarion voices throughout all this that spoke with clarity um, unambiguous uh, compassion and, and science on the podium. You know, um, I have many friends that were CNN regulars. I'm sure you guys do too. Um, it was the clinicians who were the ones that were really driving so much of these narratives and conversations. And I think, again, it's sort of a proof of concept to say um, we can replicate that. And it, it wasn't necessarily a plan, but now we can imagine from those lessons, um, thinking about climate savvy healthcare providers to be a trusted resource, to be credible and to be able to maintain a patient centric posture in all these things that are coming down the pike. And so 
that's what we've tried to advance here is a sense that this concept of climate medicine, we're, we're reinventing it, or sorry, we're inventing it. And we'd love, you know, more feedback on, is this a thing, climate medicine? Um, it, what's very exciting is our fellowship, which we were turning out one a year, we one realized way too few. Um, and, and two realized that we, with Zoom, and the uh, ascendancy of remote work, we're like, why do, why do these fellows have to work in our emergency department? And why do they have to be emergency physicians? And to be clear, we started that because that's how I could administrate it. That's, that's my department. And I knew I could get it done there. But now with the uh, dean stepping in and, and funding our program, we are able to rethink it. We have remote fellows. Uh, we have two, two IM, one family, one, uh, two EM. And next year, we've actually pulled in a, a neurologist and a neurosurgeon fellow, which is kind of mind blowing until they sit down and demonstrate their passion and talk about vascular risk and uh, plant-based diets and the work that they are doing and what they're really excited about. And, and then, you know, it clicks. I love it because this is an all hands on deck project. This is not um, a specific subset of physicians. It's really all of us. Our five fellows are placed now at these five federal agencies at USGCRP, NOAA, CDC, HHS, Department of Climate Change and Health Equity, and EPA. They're also working very closely with NGO partners. Um, some are direct one-to-one -one preceptorships, and then groups like Eco America and the subsidiary Climate for Health. Our fellows are doing one-month rotations with them and, and focusing on uh, communication strategies, you know, learning from the, you know, very talented expert folks who have been in this, you know, um, field for decades. We don't want to stop there. We want to make sure that we're um, getting our product across the educational continuum. Um, we're not quite doing so much with lay people, but we are um, building a medical school curriculum, which had historically been a two week um, senior elective. And now we're um, integrating into a longitudinal curriculum build. Um, it helps that our university, our med school is now redesigning it anyway. So it's an easy interface to say, if you're, hey, if you're building it from scratch or reimagining re it, let us come in. And, you know, um, we're having, you know, the very highest levels of the med school are now on board with this. Um, so we'll have a longitudinal curriculum through years one through four. And for those um, uh, senior med students that want that real uh, deeper dive experience, we're giving them a two-week um, full elective, which happens in, in March. And then, you know, what about the what about the the doctor in Tampa that has a practice that's been out two years with or, or five, ten years with three kids? What's what do they have? And so we reimagine what that could look like, and said, you know, let's create a diploma in climate medicine, very much in the vein of a diploma of trop med and hygiene, for instance, which is no one's primary um, um, board, if you will, but it's, it's a diploma that they can attach to their name. It's roughly a 300 hour curriculum. And we would imagine this would roll out in individual um, five one week segments that we're gonna have out there where anyone can jump in and there'd be different themes, obviously. Uh, anyone can jump in, anyone get a certificate, if you want the diploma, you do all five, but it gives you a credential, again, to be able to um, be, a, be, be able to, you know, look at your boss or your CEO or your dean or um, whomever and say, I'm, I'm qualified to, to take these opportunities, which we know will be coming down the pike. So bringing this all together, what, what how do we advance a comprehensive agenda for uh, healthcare professionals. And again, this came out of a health affairs article we did. Um, and I'm happy to send that to you as a, as a follow-up, but really there's, there's many, many different things. And again, there's no one size fits all. We've doubled down on education. Um, I think the research portfolio, it, it, you know, there's webinars happening this week on centers of excellence and, you know, um, uh, NIEHS has spoken about a very large sum of money now being pivoted towards climate change. So uh, get ready for that. But, you know, thinking about on campus, you know, dedicated curricula, uh, formal training programs, whether it's master's, MD, PhD, 
interdisciplinary research, we in Colorado have benefited immensely by partnering up with all of our um, CU Boulder colleagues who have cross credentials at the national labs like NCAR, NOAA, and um, places you know um, in, in Boulder. Um, thinking about outreach and advocacy, we've got a climate medicine rounds. We just did one last night for our, our university, uh, our, me our me um, medical campus community. Um, dedicated university support, and then thinking about what, what are sort of similar things you could dovetail in. So global health equity, um, social justice and, and diversity and inclusion initiatives. They're very much, um, um, many of those programs are already robust on a, a lot of our campuses and we should be interacting with them saying, hey, how can we um, bring issues of climate justice into these programs? Um, there's a lot of work happening at the, at the uh, college levels. So health society engagement, there, I'm going to sort of slide in a couple seconds of the medical society consortium on climate and health which is where all the colleges are coming together but thinking about policy statements um, dedicated space within peer-reviewed journals um, greening infrastructure projects for clinics and uh and then of course social media and then you know at the bigger levels we just talked a lot about this you know climate health uh, initiatives so what's the renewable energy plan how are we demonstrating decarbonization, which again, carrots and sticks, um, reporting of hospital metrics, and then other things that are adjunctives to, to all this, which is a carbon offset programs and divestment programs. <clears throat> Pay attention to these two groups. The National Academies is now going deep into this and they're gonna be really leading a lot of conversations. Um, on climate change and they have a thing right now on decarbonizing the US healthcare sector. So just tune into the NAM for, um, again, there's a lot of energy now shifting to that. And then as I spoke about the Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health is where all the colleges are going to. So I know we have ASEP and SAM there, ACP is there, Family Medicine, Pediatrics, ACOG. So um, it, it, it's not meant to, um, it, it's really meant to be a, a commons for the colleges to come together and, and kind of compare, um, you know, what are best practices and how can we get um, their members, you know, information on climate and health issues. So I think that's going to probably, it's been growing steadily. I, I, my sense is that it's going to be an exponential curve over the next few years. So the value proposition to all this is that to date, no one has been trained to raise their hand for any of this stuff. Right. And everyone is going to need health expertise, communities, you know, academic, hospital CEOs, politicians, nonprofits, other government ed entities. And all will need climate plans and all will need health impacts. So it really it's it's our hope that we can create the rationale and roadmap to elevate the voices of our healthcare workforce with patient centric policies for these unprecedented challenges to come. Thank you so much for uh, listening and I'll uh, stop sharing and we can uh, have a conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamry for the wonderful talk. And thank you again, Dr. Martin for inviting me to be part of this. Um, it all seems overwhelming. I think from the scope of the problem at hand to the time frame that seems glacial yet feeling like the fuse of the bomb has been lit. I think the effort of combating climate changes, as it was pointed out in the afterword of Dr. Lemery's book, Environmatics, Herculean. Our younger generation doesn't have to be sold to, on the reality of climate change. And not too long ago, as my generation was growing up, we had to extrapolate how the poor polar bear and the shrinking ice caps had to do with us that beyond the motive of altruism, why would anybody care about what we do for the environment? Unfortunately, the effects of man-made activities of the planet we call home are readily evidenced these days. And our younger generations are growing up witnessing the consequences of fearing for the future as more catastrophes unfold and human survival seems to be a stick. To the younger generation, I would say take matters into your own hands. For the medical students that are training right now, you are 10 to 15 years ahead of me when it comes to learning about the connection of climate change and health. Learn about it, talk about it, do something about it. 
the medical students at UVA, which now you know, has a group that includes all the allied health professionals, have really come together with a strong voice. From completing and presenting a planetary health report card to the school and demanding more education about the subject matter, to the creation of the first climate and health elective at UVA, which I will be co-directing in January 2022, to further work on presenting the content as a theme in the entire curriculum, the students have been and will be at the heart of that effort. As you start your practice, there will be so many more Dr. Lemery's out there teaching and talking about the facts that an unhealthy environment is as much of a risk factor, if not greater, to human health than cigarette smoking, dietary indiscretion, and sedentary lifestyle. You will be the effectors of school curriculum and of local, regional, and national policy to make the necessary changes. And even right now, there are so many things that you can do. Write a letter, talk to your representatives, and demand accountability, and most importantly, exercise your power to vote. If you're going to be part of the elective this upcoming year, we'll certainly talk about how you can take further action. Thank you again. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Homan and Jay. Um, there, there's so much to think about there. Um, uh, I want to uh, make sure that we've got time to incorporate audience questions. And so for anyone listening at home, please type in questions that you have. Uh, we've already got a couple questions here that are similarly themed, so I'll, I'll read out uh, Bridget's question. Um, uh, says, thank you for speaking with us today and for including nursing in your discussion. Um, uh, are you also working with local nursing schools to improve curriculum and practice? And, and Jay, especially looking at you, how you formally integrated both MD and then also nursing programs. And then her other question is, have you found it easy to balance work in bedside medicine and work on policy environmental issues as well? You strike that balance. A yeah, great question. So we're working with our nursing school here as we build out this diploma program. Um, we think it's going to be important to have them um, have a, you know, basically be a part of it. Um, where the goal would be with this diploma program to have, you know, 80 or 85 percent similar curriculum, but then have perhaps a different track, which would allow nurses to talk about nursing centric issues, physicians and even APPs as well. Um, and perhaps even, you know, affiliated um, practitioners like pharmacists. Um, they're at these national meetings, nursing, they're in some ways they're, they're more well-organized than, uh, any other group that I've come across. And, um, again, the, uh, they have a, often a, a big presence at the medical society consortium for climate and health. There's an annual meeting there. I think the end of March, maybe the beginning of March, but if you just go to that website, you can see it. And, you know, hopefully for those in Virginia, it's an easy, easy to get to. In terms of balance, um, it, you know, it, it's always a, I think for many of us, it's just a challenge. How do you do it? Um, uh, I've been lucky in the last couple of years where I've been able to get some contracts, which help me reduce the amount of uh, clinical hours I have as you get older, you know, shift work is brutal overnights, forget it. Uh, but it's the three to 11s that kill you too. Cause you work eight hours a day and then you show up at your three o'clock job to start your day. Um, so that's been a, a blessing and, you know, I, I, I so, but always a challenge and, you know, this stuff doesn't pay, nothing pays you as well as seeing patients, right? So to, to be able to, um, have a commensurate buy down and workload, you, you have to pull on a lot of, uh, zoom and ACA and other work to, to balance out seeing patients. So it's a, I would just say it's a reflection I have once a week in terms about, am I, am I working too much? Do I like what I'm doing? All those things. I know it's very common. So it's sort of a non-answer, but um, I will say that um, the driver, this, this topic is so important and it feels like everything, every time you're out there, it feels good. So it's not a, it's not a um, field where you question the value of it. I, I, I think, so I think that drives a lot of, um, a lot of the work there. I mean, for many of us. Um, you know, I, I think that Homan and I both as hospitalists can absolutely relate to that and that balance. I'm wondering, Homan, do you have any other thoughts on that? You do a lot of work uh, with regard to advocacy and clinical education. Um, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, similarly, also runs on passion. I think, you know, like Jay said, the, the work doesn't pay, but at the same time, I think having a reflection of why am I doing this and what is important and even just looking at my children and knowing that this is the future that I'm working on, I think it gives me a lot of gratitude um, and to, to be able to affect changes um, in this realm. Um, I think you know, I, I would um, you know, kind of also specifically talk about the interdisciplinary side of things. So at our organization, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, it's named to include uh, all you know, health professionals, um, including our public health colleagues, um, pharmacists, nursing, you know, um, physician assistants. And interestingly, the first school in Virginia that has offered a climate and health elective was actually Shenandoah University. Um, school of um, PA uh, program that had a uh, first elective that um, had uh, been completed this past summer. And our uh, nursing colleagues at UVA has actually been great at putting together a program. Um, they started the inaugural um, meeting um, last year and we'll have a second meeting this year uh, in February, I believe February 15 and 17 in the evening time. Um, for um, to uh, bring together folks to talk about the issue of climate change and health. And this is really um, in a large part nursing driven with input from um, the physician side of things. So very um, heartwarming that we're doing this together as Ally Health Professional. Fantastic, thank you, Holman. Um, we have a lot of great questions rolling in here. Um, uh, knowing, Jay, that you were just at COP26, this question, it's a big question, uh, but, but one that I think all of us will be interested to hear. Uh, Matthew Meyer asks, how do we bring industry to this conversation in a meaningful way? Uh, what insights do you have on that? Uh, <clears throat> that is a really great question. So the question is, you know, bringing industry in. Um, there's so many avenues to pursue this. Um, this is not my realm of expertise, but I know um, sharing us out there meeting with consumer groups, you know, um, you know, moms historically have organized them in an extremely powerful constituency under the banner of moms to say, you know, we want Procter and Gamble to do this, and to be able to provide ammunition for these groups with health bullet points based in science with references um, really gives. Um, these groups, the confidence to uh, move forward. Sometimes industries reach out as well and say, we want to move in this direction, but we don't really know how, and we're not sure. So I think our role uh, can be active um, communicators, bringing forth best science. Um, I, I think we can get into trouble sometimes. And, and again, I, I've been, I've had my wrist slapped for this because you're saying, Hey man, you're equivocating. I, I'm actually not. I'm saying, in, it's important that we don't think we're experts in everything climate change. We are experts in health. And I think I have been, I have fallen folly to that where I've been in a debate with somebody in a live audience about carbon capture and measurement of China. And I realized halfway through, is like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so, um, but with that said, stick to the health expertise because there's so much ammunition and, you know, have your radar out there and look for pressure points. Be like, you know what, if I can get into that room, I can say this, this and this, um, that could make a difference. Um, so th that's my thoughts. Yeah, that's um, that's fantastic. Uh, I think thinking about the humility and, and the recognition of limits within our duties um, is a great point. Uh, Rebecca Soisman has asked a related question that you know, goes back to your, your idea of the carrot and the stick. Um, and, and she asks, other than reimbursement changes and goodwill, what do you think it will take for health system CEOs to make substantial shifts in how they address climate change through operations of their systems in patient care, community engagement? She, she adds, or is it truly just those reimbursement shifts and hopefully goodwill? No, I think that's part of it. I think it's going to be peer pressure. Um, I think Healthcare systems are always looking out at one another, who's doing what. <clears throat> you know, um, we just had a fascinating conversation with Nick Watts, who is the um, sustainability officer for the National Health System of the United Kingdom, right? Monster, it's the entire nation's healthcare system. And it's a monstrous, monstrously scaled, scaled up. Nothing, we don't have anything analogous here, but he has the first zero emission uh, carbon neutral ambulance. So that's like another, like, can you imagine? the publicity that that would have for a healthcare system to be like, this is our, 
you know, carbon neutral ambulance where ambulances aren't zipping through often, you know, lower socioeconomic neighborhoods on their way to their emergency department, you know, with um, lots of carbon emissions. So I think peer pressure is um, going to be a part of it. I think med students and clinicians and patient advocacy groups are going to start demanding, like, why is the hospital serving meatloaf? You know, shouldn't we have plant-based diets here? It's a freaking hospital, right? So I think it's going to come from many things. So I do think it's going to be healthcare systems wanting to do the right thing. It's going to be marketing and image and peer pressure. And, um, <clears throat> and I think uh, the stick will be kind of the elephant in the room. Um, right now, it's it's just an idea concept, but I, I, I bet you it'll start to codify in, in a few years. I agree with that. And I, you know, I think a combination of the competitive nature of healthcare system and, and what regional, other regional hospitals do, um, if there are incentives that coincide with saving money and saving, you know, and making a healthier environment to begin with, um, but also demand from um, the local population and also um, the employees of that healthcare system um, can really go a long way to affect changes. Fantastic thoughts. Um, we're just running out of time, but I want to make sure I, I get to one more question here. Um, uh, Dela Alexander uh, raises the question, are health insurance companies engaged in this conversation in some way? It's going to be an effective way of, of having some financial skin in the game. Uh, that, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defer to, to Homan on that one. Do you, you have any sense of that? I actually don't know if they're part of any of the consortiums, uh, but we can certainly look that up and get back to you all. I feel like the general answer is not really. <laughs> That's uh, that. Uh, if, if you two don't know, then I that would be my guess as well. But that's um, that is a great question, and unfortunately, there's so many other great questions coming in. Um, I think we'll we'll have to call it there. Um, I want to thank uh, thank you, Jay and Homan, so much. It, it is just such an important topic of conversation at this point in time, um, and, and just so entertaining and engaging. So thank you for coming. We wish we could have hosted you in person, um, but we really appreciate it. Um, I, I also just want to remind uh, everybody that um, for eligible participants, you can claim continuing education credit. Um, this is the final event of the academic semester, and I can't think of a, of a better event to, to end it with. Um, but we will be joining back up again in February, so please uh, uh, join us when we do. Uh, we have a very exciting schedule of speakers. And again, uh, thank you so much to our participants. Um, there's a lot of food for thought. We appreciate it. Thank you all. Great to be here. Wahoo. Wah.